Well, welcome everybody. I um, appreciate your patience as we set up the lab. Um, it's wonderful to see so many people here. Um, there are two events going on um, in celebration of um, the partnership between art and English and display. Um, so here for the reading, we're going to be here between five and seven. And I want you to know that the atmosphere is as is, is informal and casual as we can make it without getting noisy. Um, so the idea is if, if you want to stay at the reading, um, please do. Sit tight, stay for every reader. Um, if you're interested in seeing the art exhibit, which is also taking place in the fourth floor main art gallery on the same floor, just that way, south a little bit, um, you're welcome to kind of um, work in and out, um, come in and out, um, hopefully between introductions. So here we are to celebrate the 100th issue of Display Magazine. Um, readers are here um, representing readers from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, and 2010s. Um, so a, a great turnout tonight. Some things I'd like to say about the 100, 100th issue is um, numbering. Let's talk numbering. Kind of an interesting thing happened on the way to archiving 100 issues of display. There are actually a couple of different ways to interpret 100 issues, so I'm going to share those with you. Um, this 100th issue has approximately 60 pieces of literature and 60 pieces of art from those 100 original issues from 1965 to the fall of 2014. So that's when we officially hit our 100th issue printed as in held in your hand. What we found out as we archived is due to a couple of little numbering snafus, which happen with publications now and then, um, we thought originally that winter 2013's issue, which is labeled 100th, was truly the 100th issue. <laughs> but on the way to hand archiving these things and counting issue numbers, I found that there were two numbers that just never appeared on covers, and that was 84 and 85. Somewhere between transition of display advisors as well as print and graphic staff, as well as different processes, going from typewriters to computer files to computerized graphics and PDF files, we lost those numbers. And then, curiously enough, we lost number 92. I don't know what significance 92 has. Maybe one of you know and can let me know. So truly, the 100th issue, I would say, is the one that's actually labeled 103, fall 2014. Okay. <laughs> So, you know, depending on where you fall, as far as a, you're a purist, as far as the number of covers, or like me, you're into the physicality of holding the book and saying, this is the 100th, this is where, where I'm falling. So, hence the 1965 to 2014 here. So, the process of uh, culling 100 issues for work that would be representative of GRCC and all of you and your writing and your experiences and creative writing classes and as displays student editors um, was not easy and I'd like to acknowledge some people who really helped along the way. Um, my name, by the way, is Mary Ann Lassert. I've, I've spoke with and emailed with many of you. I'm the current display advisor for the English department. And a couple of my um, predecessors are here, David Cope and Walter Lockwood. So um, first and foremost, there was a first round um, going through of every issue of display since 1965. Um, Walt left with a huge archived box of displays. And because he had, um, what did we figure out it was, 36 and a half years? of advisor experience, 30-some, mm -hmm. 30 36 and a half. 
Um, he went through those and selected um, two to four, let's say, per year that we would put in that final collection pool. Um, David Cope did the same with his, with his years as advisors. Um, and then there were readers in the English department, James Hayes and Heide Meister, who helped read and select even further. Um, and finally, from my time, 2010 to present, um, I selected a certain amount of um, pieces per issue that we really wanted to try and include. And of course, we had about 200 pieces then. Um, so Robin Van Royen was doing the same thing that I was doing in the art department, going through, marking art. Um, and so we got to the point where we had about 200 each, and we got to the point where we decided, OK, 50. That makes sense. There's 100 years, 100 issues, 100 pieces. That's it. We have to do this. Um, and then it got to the point where we couldn't cut any more great pieces anymore. So in a near tearful phone conversation, we agreed to let each other go at 60 some. <laughs> So I'm not even sure how many numbers of pieces ended up here. I know that we've taken great care of the ones that are here. Um, 60 some sounds nice as a number to me. Um, a couple other people who were really instrumental in that process, um, Mike Cloudwitter, the GRCC librarian and archivist, scanned all of those original hard copy pre-digital file uh, issues for us. And actually, he's working with me now on a digital archive of all issues of display that we hope to have ready um, sometime in the future. Um, Amanda Kosick was our designer in graphics and printing. And Julie Stevenson Williams is a former display advisor that had a few years between David and I, who was not able to be here. But I want to thank her for her time as an advisor also. So I'd like to get our reading started. And again, um, as many readers who feel comfortable sitting up front, I, I'd invite you to sit up front so you don't have to crawl over our, our audience, but that's OK, too. We're, we're crowded, and I love it. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to each introduce a group of our readers. Um, and we're going to start at the beginning. There's a reading order sequence that hopefully readers and many of you have. Um, Walt Lockwood will introduce readers from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, and each of us is going to do that as a chunk. We're going to talk about our time as display advisor and the people that are going to be reading. And then so readers, please remember, if you can, to reintroduce yourself. Um, at least state your name and the title of your work before you launch in and read, OK? Um, David Cope will introduce next, and he'll be introducing some readers from the 90s and 2000s. Um, some of them will go a little bit out of order, and that's okay, because David and I didn't want to go up, down, up, down, up, down, depending on students we were more familiar with. And then I'll introduce our most recent readers. And last but not least, Walt Lockwood will return. Um, he was our Display Writing Awards judge this year, which I thought was absolutely fitting for this year. Um, and he is going to give some comments as a judge on three of the Display Writing Award winners that he'll also read tonight. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Walt and let him get this party started. Thanks. Thanks, Marianne. It is the 100th year of the college. It's the 50th year of display. So 103 is actually number 100. It's got to be. I thought maybe the problem was that originally we, we numbered the issues in Roman numerals. And it got to a point where nobody could read them anymore. <laughs> knew how to do, Dave couldn't do them beyond uh, 10, I think, right? <laughs> Something like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, I started teaching here in the midpoint of the 64-65 school year, and I was immediately given a, a group, a club called the Pins Club, which was a little writer's club at the college. And there had been earlier ones by different names, but uh, uh, 
I don't know why I got it, uh, but uh, I got it. I, I found myself with it. And uh, what they had done that year was to publish, as the result of a, a little writing contest they had within the department, the winners of that and a small mimeographed bulletin kind of thing uh, that they called display. Now, I was less interested in running a writer's club or being advisor to it than I was in taking that display idea and making it into something that actually was a semesterly uh, literary review. And uh, I took it to, to these kids and they thought it was a good idea. And uh, we found some financing for it. And uh, I, I wasn't crazy about the name display. I don't know if anybody's ever thought of that, but uh, it didn't seem very jazzy. And so we thought of names. I had, I had worked on the Lit Magazine at Michigan State and it had been called Tarot, which uh, after a couple years we thought too arty, so we changed it to the Red Cedar Review and it's been that ever since. So we thought, how about the Grand River Review? Or uh, somebody suggested Southwestern Exposure and somebody else uh, <laughs> Indecent Exposure. And none of, them, none of them quite clicked, so we stayed with display, and it's been a very serviceable name for 50 years now. Uh, I advised for 73 issues, and um, uh, it was always student-run. It was student-written and student-edited and uh, st uh, laid out and designed by students. And uh, so I kind of just directed them uh, and they did it, and it has always been that way. And I think that's very healthy. Uh, for a few years, the Michigan Collegiate Press Association included it in their award ceremony at the end of the year. These were awards for college newspapers. We always did well in those with a newspaper, but in those few years, display always took the top prizes. So it, it was pretty good publication. Uh, I think more important than anything was the display room, and I, th I wish display still had a room. Uh, I, at the time, had an office-classroom combination with Dr. Marina Sweats, who was the head of our department, and uh, interesting character, uh, and a wonderful mentor to many of us, I know. And uh, he helped set the tone of that room, but I think people at a commuter college like this need a place to go. They need a place to connect with people. And that display collegiate room, it was the newspaper room and the display room both. Both staffs met there and we had classes in there. Uh, it was a gathering place for creative spirits and a fair amount of lunacy that I think Sweats had a lot to do with. Um, those invited to read today, and not, not all of them could come. Uh, did Joe Dion show up anywhere? I know it, he hates to come to Grand Rapids. He lives in Traverse City, but uh, anyway, uh, those who are reading today represent the best of what happened uh, in 100 uh, copies of this now historic magazine. Uh, I've been asked to introduce this early group of writers all at once, and it's, uh, it's very fun and an honor to do it. They've all been my students and friends, some of them colleagues, some of them display editors. One, at least, has actually been the advisor of display as well. Many things have come full circle. Um, they're all very dear to me, and uh, it is a, a fun experience doing these introductions. I'll mention Joe Dion just in passing. He was the earliest star we had in Display Magazine. Uh, amazing, uh, it, it, even a neophyte teacher could see uh, the, you know, the, the ability of this guy in both prose and poetry. And he did, uh, we commissioned a, a play from him, which he wrote called Breakfast of Oranges and Blue Shade. It was Fred Sibulski's First, it was his directorial debut, uh, and now he's the, the grand old man of Grand Rapids Theater, and, and it was the beginning of a theater program at the college. So that play and Joe Dion are very important. I wish you were here. David Cope will be the first, and Dave Cope uh, was 
also an early star of the magazine. He was later 60s, I think 68. And uh, a talent that it took no genius to spot. His poetry just was hugely energetic. And uh, there's such wonderful quality to his writing. He was editor at a time when display was, how do I put it? Uh, it was finding its voice. It was, find, it was figuring out what it was. And I, there was one issue. I, I was trying to, th I think it was number five. It was a little green one with the, one. the celery on the front. The one that almost got you fired. Yeah, <laughs> that was the one. There was such marvelous stuff in that, uh, all the way around. And there were also uh, some, some uses of words and expressions that were edgy at the time. They certainly wouldn't be anymore but they were pushing the envelope anyway. And we had some trouble with that, a little bit of it. But uh, we fought it. David was a fighter. And uh, we managed to, to come out, to lay the foundations at least for a magazine with integrity. And uh, I didn't get fired. I'm, I'm very happy about that. Uh, there, were there was a little bit of talk about it, but not much. David's accomplishments are many, um, many books of poetry and anthologies of poetry he has put together. Uh, he is the fourth poet laureate of Grand Rapids, editor and publisher of Big Scream for, gosh, almost, 40, as, 40, 40, yeah, almost as long as display. Uh, a Pushcart Prize winner and so much more. Uh, he is a colleague who, who has taught creative writing and Shakespeare and who knows what else. And uh, my daughter had the thrill in his final year, last year, of taking both Shakespeare and creative writing from him uh, before she went on someplace else. G.F. Corrick, uh, I think, came a year after David. Is that right? I know they've been uh, lifelong friends. They connected there. Corrick uh, was another editor who helped the magazine uh, discover what it was. His, his work uh, is hard to characterize, but it was always uh, uh, an unusual angle of vision, uh, of life, uh, usually full of irony and, and humor, and uh, an eccentric way of seeing, and, and it was good. And I'm not the least bit surprised to see him here today. Uh, besides being a poet, he has a lifelong passion for a baseball. He has a bone spur just like the great DiMaggio right now. <laughs> He's on crutches. Uh, Corrick, like Cope, met his, the love of his life in the display collegiate office. They both married him. Yeah? Yeah? So we were good for many things there. And uh, his work has appeared in magazines and anthologies. Uh, these are his words. He thanks JC for being, he says, both a lily pad and a launching pad. The former, the lily pad, for being a place where what he thought and what he was mattered. And the latter, the launching pad, for being encouraging, for encouraging him to dream. He will be second in line. The third is Barb Sonnier. Barb is right back here. She is, uh, oh, by the way, uh, David is reading a poem called Once Upon the Contemplation of War, and it, may, it must be very weird to go back that many years and read so, something from your early days, you know? Uh, <laughs> humbling, anyway. Uh, Corix is called Untitled. He was always bad at titles. <laughs> a poem. Barb Sonnier is going to read Wind Blows East. Uh, Barb was in the mid-70s. I remember the creative writing class uh, she was in as if it were yesterday, first floor of the, the old West Building. Uh, marvelous bunch in there. They were mostly a little bit older than the normal student, mostly women, and very lively and a joy to teach, and they kept me on my toes. Barb's work was bright. It was edgy. It was funny, just full of potential. I think you were painting uh, fancy furniture at the time, right? Yeah. That was your job. Yep. 
She would go on to the University of Michigan, and then to Western, and then come full circle back as a creative writing instructor at the college here. Uh, her body of poetry and accomplishment continues to grow. She publishes in poetry reviews, has had pushcart nominations, took first prize in the MacGuffin National Poetry Hunt. She was my office partner for quite a number of years. Uh, we enjoyed each other's company, I think, didn't we? I think. Yeah. yeah, seems like it. Uh, we laughed, we complained about papers together, uh, and never once dusted the place in all those years. Never. Uh, in her retirement uh, and in mine, a love of horses continues to connect us. Another one, uh, this one from the 80s, Buck Matthews. Buck is right back here. A name very familiar to many. Uh, he was my student in a night class. It was full of adults. One of them was Dave Wallace, a uh, very lively bunch. Dave was the, uh, the editor of Wonderland Magazine uh, at the press at the time. And uh, Bach was, has been so visible in the community for so many years. He was weatherman and, uh, for Wood TV and a talk show host on television. And then the general manager of Blue Lake, uh, the public radio station. And uh, <clears throat> His, he's going to read an excerpt from his story, Catch the High Tide. Catch the High Tide was in the best of our 25-year uh, volume as well. Uh, of all the stories that have been written in this display, this is one of a handful of the best. And it was interesting to discover that uh, this public man was, was such an exceptional writer. Um, I remember uh, the classes being lively, Buck being very outspoken. I made him write a sonnet once, and he complained bitterly about it. <laughs> I thought it would be good for him. <clears throat> Maybe seven years ago, he paid me the curious honor of doing a tribute to me on the Blue Lake uh, public radio station on the occasion of my death. <laughs> I didn't hear the, the, the tribute, but a friend of mine did. And she, she called me and said it was extremely nice. <laughs> so I got hold of Buck, and uh, I told him that I was playing golf that day. And then something twiny and like uh, reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated or something like that. Uh, but anyway, Buck was relieved he had been misinformed. But he said he wouldn't retract a word of it. <laughs> and God bless him for that. It was, it was sort of like Huck Finn going to his own funeral, you know. And last in the line is Kim Weingarten. Uh, Kim, also from the 80s, uh, uh, she's going to read a poem called Freedom Lost. What a shining student she was, uh, full of such obvious promise. Even back then, uh, she, her prose and poetry were done with the greatest precision and care. She would come full, full circle like some of the others and become a, a writing teacher here, creative writing. And uh, she's been here for 25 years now, which astounds me. She's a graduate of the Iowa Writing Workshop as an MFA in creative writing and has studied in Russia as a Fulbright scholar and has taught Russian lit. And uh, Russia figures prominently in her recent poetry. She publishes in Poetry of Reviews and Anthologies and often does readings with Barb Sonny. So David is first, and uh, please mention your names as you come up, all right? Well, we'll see how this one goes. Uh, Dave Cope, and this is Once Upon the Contemplation of War. Okay, I gotta uh, give it a tiny bit of context. Um, nowhere does it mention the war, the Vietnam War. Uh, it was raging and we were right in the middle of it as students. I was already thinking about should I go to Canada. I had already had two friends killed. I had another friend whose brother sent back uh, Vietnamese fingers in the mail. Um, I could not deal with that up front. 
what I wound up writing about was ordinary things that had previously meant a great deal to me that um, suddenly were absolutely meaningless. Um, that was where I was at that point. And uh, this poem sort of catches that. It's a clunky piece. Um, um, Lucy Deloof, who was my poetry teacher, um, had me write a syllabic, and it's one of those rare times when I wrote something that was one of those formal things, which I've always despised anyways. Um, so there's a lot of extra syllables in it that I would have cut out if it had been up to me. And uh, <laughs> I had, reading it over, I kind of had to laugh because I was making fun of old people that had silver hair. <laughs> <laughs> Shit comes full circle in so many ways. <laughs> I'll try to do this. I'll try to get through this without laughing. We'll see. <laughs> I have to think about my friends, I guess. In the sidewalk by the benches, there are cracks where insects crawl and pigeons eat. The child has been to the library and has seen all the silver-haired geniuses wrinkling wrinkled brows at yellow pages. There's a smell about a library, a smell like old trunks and attics, and so he left. On the brown bench by the crosses and the green statues of the park, he curiously f stares, his face unscrewed, at the insects trund trundling among the wispy bits washed out and brown. The pigeons salute him from the gray battlements of their castles, library gargoyles, and the tops of war monuments. There's a grayness in the park, a quiet, an evenness, somehow in the middle of the screeching car horn city. The brown-coated and washed-out old men make no noise turning the pages of their newspapers, and the knitting grandmas are hidden by the great green bush by the bench. Only the fountain sounds. Its hollow, squishing waters arc across the gray-green pool, fall, mingle in a liquid body. My friends are on those monuments now. G.F. Cork. I, uh, I ordered a Stormtrooper costume for Halloween, and all they sent me was a boot, so. <laughs> J.C. was a, an incredible place for me. I probably would have been there a year earlier. I went and peeked in the office that uh, they were talking about. There were these tables that I swear that were there before they built the building. They're all shoved together, and Lockwood and Sweats are behind this wall of books. I walked in there and there were people throwing things and loud music. I thought, I'm going to die if I go in here. So I, I waited a year until I was a little older. No more mature, but a little older. Um, as Walt said, my poem is untitled. I think I even misspelled untitled, so it's not on here. The shadow of the morning rain rolls between the clouds, somewhat beneath the moon, a moon like an eye pulled from its socket, gutted and worn dried of blood, a moon hanging like an apple, rotting, ready to fall and break against the earth. The shadow of a silent bird rolls across a stretch of gray with the directness of movement, like a sea that rolls, breaking against the earth, waves like roaring angels, where the sand and the grass roll with the same movement. The shadow of the morning rain rolls with the sea, a sea gray like matter, gray and thick, a day dried of blood like matter. What matters when the day and night roll with the same movement? It's all relatively simple, relatively easy, as pi r equals the square root of a problem. All pies are equally square, a problem of not being well-rounded. Old men pulled from their sockets roll with the same movement as the sea breaking against the earth, where the grass and the sand roll together and rainbows creep like silent birds to break against the sky, a problem of matter. What matters when the morning rain rolls like roaring angels with directness of movement 
and the old men and the carpenters are somewhere between beneath the moon, and now there is the problem of carpenters. It's all relative, as everything matters, as carpenters matter, and the silver fish that float upon the sea with the same movement as an old man silently drawing his one last breath. The shadow of the morning rain rolls between the clouds. Across a stretch of gray matter, thick with sand and grass. And there is the problem of carpenters and sun that's never seen somewhat beneath the shadow of the moon. A moon like a pie, equally square, with the same movement as everything that is matter. Matter gutted and worn, dried of blood, all relatively simple. But there is a problem of carpenters. Thank you. Sonier. I have no little orienting story to tell. Walt told it all, told it well <laughs> enough. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Wind blows east. It's March again. I stop in my room and through my window opened onto the spare small yard, I try to sniff the West Virginia mountain wind like a bird dog placing a partridge scent. I lived so well those too few days that now I know I'm homesick for Monongahela. Monongahela going up and up and down and circling north and snow and circling south and bare earth and spring and circling north and winter's snow again. I breathe the height of pines and giggle the water over rocks and hush the rhododendron forest. The mountains, sugared in the mist, lead up to Blackbird Knob and see in sun more miles to the south than any map could know, I know. I know the song of the runoffs gurgling, sometimes crashing down and down, but yesterday they were not, next week they will not be again. I know the farmer narrow, bent, and walking guided by his plow and mule between boulders on a patch of mountain he calls a field. The leather lines he holds are lifelines, not quaint, not sad, but somehow quaint and sad. To see again without wet shoes or blistered feet or dry joints makes these first days of March this special time in Michigan. Next year, will I stop and lie close to the meadows and ride the mountains of West Virginia, Monongahela, will I be restless for a while? I'm Buck Matthews. Um, I should say briefly before I read the first page of my typewritten version of To Catch the High Tide that I wouldn't be here if it were not for Mary Tyler Moore. Um, I read in the Sunday issue of the press many years ago that himself had written a screenplay that was to be made into an HBO movie. Um, and. Uh, I had wanted to learn how to write dialogue. I had written a lot of expository stuff in magazines, but I, I didn't know how to write how people talk to each other. And so I called him up and I said, before you move to Hollywood, I want to take your course. He said, I'm not going to Hollywood, are you crazy? He said, I don't want to live that lifestyle. He said, uh, I write better when I'm here. And he teaches well when he's here too. Uh, I should also say that I wouldn't be here were it not for the fact that 
There was a woman named Bessie Whitford who was my English composition teacher when I was in high school in Washington, D.C., who forced us to write when uh, the very first day of her class, she said, uh, you're going to write. And we were geeks and jocks and cadets and cheerleaders and a whole, you know, the whole cross-section of, of youthdom and 99% uh, of us said, sure, that's gonna happen. <laughs> And it happened because she would not allow us not to write. And so I owe her and I owe Walt. And, and I'm very grateful for the uh, privilege of, oh, by the way, pal, um, 20 years ago, I asked him to read a novel that I was working on. And he didn't want to do that. He said, no, I, I won't do that. And I, I put my knee in his chest and he read it. And then we met for lunch. And he let me know that it was mindless crap. Um, by the way, it's going to be published. Uh, <laughs> this weekend, it'll be, uh, we, uh, you know, if all things fall together right, it's going to be published it online. To to <laughs> Listen, I've got, 30, I've got 35 rejection slips from people who agreed with you. And so we're publishing it online. Anyway, Catch the High Tide is a true story, but it's compressed. All of the things that were in the story, including the fact that my grandfather died in my arms, um, all of those things happened, but as a class project, we were assigned to write a story about our, our lives, and so I compressed a number of things together, and this is how it goes. It's like an old snapshot you might find tucked between the back pages of some long, unopened book. The details pretty much intact, but the colors faded to shades of sepia. Now and then the scene reappears in my memory, tugging at me like a child not wanting to go home from the carnival, reminding me that where I'm going may not be as important as where I've been. That mental snapshot is of my paternal grandfather opening the high picket gates of his lower Potomac home to which we fled on summer weekends as if the British were burning the White House again. No matter when we arrived, there he'd be opening the gates. His timing wasn't good. It was perfect, every time. The two-hour drive from Washington through the red pine forests and deep green tobacco fields of Southern Maryland always ended the same way. Pop would ease up on the gas, allowing the Chevy's momentum to carry us off the Cobb Island Pike into the little cluster of salt box cottages everybody called Chigger City, making the turn at Wilmer Johnson's house into the lane to Grandpa's place. And sure enough, he'd be swinging open the first gate. Pop would goose the gas just enough to take it up the lane and through the gate beneath the wooden arch and its weathered words, hawk nest. Grandpa, wearing his nearly hidden smile, would nod to us as we drifted through. All of this just about sent the various women in our tribe into spasms each time it happened. They couldn't figure out how he did it, and you could always count on the din in the car rising considerably at least 100 yards before we hit the gate. One among them once suggested that the old man had finally had the stroke she'd been predicting for years, and in his confusion he kept a opening and closing the gate all day. I didn't know how he did it either, but from the satisfied look on Pop's face, I figured he did. It didn't matter to me, since Grandpa knew all he, that needed to be known about almost everything. That little trick seemed a natural extension of his nearly miraculous powers. Years later, I sat on his favorite stump at the edge of the orchard and smiled at how clearly traffic on the pike could be seen and heard. My grandfather was not an ordinary man. He might have failed the Norman Rockwell All-American Grandfather test had there been one. He did not look like a beardless Santa Claus. He was spare, I guess. Everything about him was in control. No loud laughter, no big talk about how great life was when he was young. His body was thin, but just right for him. He was strong, even at 82, and he gave no quarter to those proudly accumulated years. The day the long wire antenna for his old Zenith blinking eye radio blew out of the massive oak tree beside the tool shed, 
He took it right back up to the 75-foot level where it belonged. For the sake of the women, who were clustered at the kitchen window telling each other why he shouldn't be up in that tree at his age, he waited until he got back down to the 12-foot level near the top of the ladder before he fell out. Very conservative. But they nearly beat him to death, dusting him off. Thank you. so good to see so many of you here and yes this is humbling to read this particular poem because it feels like I was maybe two or three when I wrote it <laughs> that much time has gone by I'm here to read my poem but what I'm really here for is to support my students a number of my creative writing students are here to read their work they have been exceptional to work with and 10 15 years from now I may see some of them on the street and not be able to call them by name, but I will certainly remember their work. This poem is called Freedom Lost. Drawn in confinement, I watch you, wind-tossed hair that moves so unlike you. Laughter long paralyzed by pavement unyielding, your body tumbled from metal to stillness. Your reach will not take you to touch. Memory forgets the weight of you. Wheels now carry you silent to playground children running with open arms. Thank you. Marianne told me that we've got lots of empty seats up here, so get your butts up here. I can see there's a real bum's rush going on here. Okay, so i got a few to do here. Many of you know that uh, I spent 18 years as a custodian before I went full-time as a professor. And when I went full-time, my first class had uh, Morgan Jarema and Carmen Bugan in it. I was blessed with two great students right from the get-go. Um, Morgan has gone on to a career of different kinds of writing here and there, but what I remember her mostly about, uh, about her mostly is that she was a true bohemian, if you can use that term. She, uh, she, she, always off the wall, always always surprising, always something new. And uh, the other thing that I, I also want, would want to recall from that period was she was the first student I had seen who had dealt specifically with uh, domestic violence issues. Um, she dealt with a lot of other things up front and open in a way that a lot of people did not talk about at that point. So um, that's Morgan. Tyler, is he here? I don't see him. Okay, so I guess he's not going to get there. Catherine Marty was in both my Shakespeare and my creative writing. Um, I remember her as the most intense student I had ever had. Um, she would come in and see me at office hour and would sit down with me and not say a word for maybe 20 minutes. We would sit there in silence together. And then all of a sudden she would unload and it would be this most wonderful conversation where I was having trouble keeping up with her because she was throwing out so many ideas at the same time. And um, she also did among other things, she, she was one of the most gifted poets I ever had. She was always rewriting her stuff. Um, when she was in my Shakespeare class, instead of having her do uh, analytical essays, which I thought would have been a waste of time with her, she wound up doing for me, uh, was it four? I think it was four portraits of female characters of Shakespeare, beautifully done. Was it six? My memory's not good, and everybody knows when me and numbers are enemies. Okay, so four. <laughs> okay, and then last in this particular group, group is Melissa Ray, who is now Melissa Jordan. Um, Melissa is, has been and still is a very dear friend of mine. Um, I have followed her through all sorts of changes in her life. Um, when she was my student, she was one who dealt with sexual harassment issues up front 
and in a lot of different ways, um, doing exposés, if you will, of, of the kinds of uh, problems young girls and young women have. Uh, but she also dealt with disability issues, um, the problems of being on the other side of, this, of, the, uh, of sanity in a way that very few people I have seen have been able to handle. Um, I can remember my friend Jim Cohn, who is an um, ADA specialist at the University of Colorado, said that she handled it in a way that was, even if you weren't sure that you were sane, the camera kept rolling, which I think is really a testament to the strength of her will. Uh, beyond that, there's a poem that she'll be reading tonight, Acceptance, which um, is really an honoring of her family and her grandfather in particular, so one of the best poems I ever had got from a student, so got three good ones here. Hope I got everything right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Morgan Jarema. I've been fortunate enough to make my living writing, and it's due in no small part to Kim Weingarten and David Cope and Walt Lockwood. So it's wonderful to be here. Um, even though I didn't make my living writing poetry, I remember early on in my career as a reporter at the Grand Rapids Press where I spent 15 years, one of my editors said, I want you to write for my section because I see poetry in your articles, which I thought was high praise. Um, this is called I Am a Poetry Slut, and when Mary Ann sent it to me, I thought, oh, shit. <laughs> I'm still a slut. Um, but it might read a little different at 47 than it did at 21. Uh. It's your early work. <clears throat> And I blew it up to 14-point type so I could see it with my first pair of bifocals. <laughs> so there. Hey, you weekend fancier of my craft. Thrust a solicitous ear at me. I'll cut you my special introductory price. Let me charm you with my consonants. Seduce you with my resonance. Place your hands upon my assonance and grind out a smooth, hot rhyme. Spend an evening in the lair of the bard, probing my pentameters, my eager quatrains quiver. Trust me, I'll make you feel like no one else has. Moist metaphors, licking luscious lyrics, a trail of tetrameters, right down to your, need a breath? I'll begin a new stanza. I've noticed that my caesuras drive you wild. <laughs> Just match my technique and we'll compose a couplet. Don't you dare withhold an image from me, little mister, or I'll bind you with my syllabic stockings. <laughs> Why are you struggling? You asked for this. Word around town is I give the best oral euphony. No sentimentality here. This is hang on for your life tactile imagery. Rhythms rise and fall in the decade of free verse. Leave one of your pagan sonnets on the nightstand. Go on now. Tell your friends the legend of the word whore. I'll just lie here basking in my open form. Thank heaven for poetic justice. Uh, I'm, I'm Catherine Marty, and what I'm going to read is actually uh, the poem in display is uh, CCW 2295 or 2495, uh, which is. Um, uh, it's the code for a concealed carry license. Um, what, what I'm going to read is, is like the director's cut, you might say. It has all of the lines that I like and none of the ones that now embarrass me. <laughs> um, uh, and it has, um, 
uh, I've actually, this, this line, it's kind of like a, a, a touchstone for me from a Raymond Chandler short story that honestly is not very good. This is the best line. Four years in Michigan ain't no summer cruise. They make you be good in them lifer states. Which is how I really think of Michigan as being a lifer state. It's, I've kind of taken it as a nickname. Around here, the speed limit is 70 miles per hour, but everyone drives 75. It doesn't matter. Escape velocity is 11,200 meters per second. This is a lifer state. We're none of us leaving. I got a right hand, same as anyone, smooth palm, flat as an alfalfa field. Turn it over and read Heartline, Lifeline, the names of a thousand towns I've never seen, places where even the Jews are half Christian in self-defense. <laughs> Years from now, I'll be in Singapore or Prague or Tanzania trying to explain how in high summer, beyond the breakwater, Lake Michigan turns a startling tropical blue. How crossing over under sail feels like slipping off the map. It never lasts. The boat tacks inland, the weather changes. No matter where I go, my voice gives me away. It's broad, twangy vowels rising the way gulls rise, cawing over every mall parking lot from White Lake to Saginaw Bay. A man walks into a pawn shop outside of Jackson, trying to catch a few dollars more for a shotgun he swears once belonged to Tim McVeigh. Touch it, he said. There's traces of his sweat in the wood of the stock. Tore down the gallows in 1847. We like our murders personal. Our killers homegrown, wholesome. They were nice boys, all of them, once. Play it close to the chest, button your coat to the top. Wrap up safe and get home early. Smile carefully. A shallow curve of the lips will do. No teeth. Not only does one hand not know what the other is doing, the right hand will probably mug the left on a residential street in Flint. The incident won't make the papers. Get down on the ground, he says. Count to 50. There's a candy wrapper in the gutter, the same dirty silver as the Saturday night special you can still half feel against the back of your neck. By 15, you've counted all the stars you can see this close to downtown's pinkish haze. 16, 17, you're counting steps on a different street in a different city, picking your way through crusted slush, past rows of poorly insulated rentals with plastic sheeting tacked to their window frames. Each winter, each house a chrysalis, breathing shallow, dreaming of Florida. Thank you. Hi, I'm Melissa Ray, now Melissa Jordan. Um, First off, I just got off a plane from Seattle about three hours ago, so I'm a little stuffy-headed still, so please bear with me. Um, this poem is called Acceptance. It um, deals with my grandmother dying. Um, my grandfather has now passed. It's been a couple of years, um, and I haven't read this since then. Um, I read it a couple of days ago, and it feels very different to me than it did when I first wrote it. Um, okay, acceptance. My grandmother is dying. My shoulders are keeping my mother steady, her tears rolling down my naked arm. We sit in warm, humid air, a glass door away from vibrant petals, long-rooted green, and thick, damp soil. My grandfather stands and disappears into the long greenhouse, leaving countless books of funeral arrangements open on the table. It's big, he says when he returns. She is gently laid down and arranged in bed, legs straight, arms light across her chest. He sits on the edge, leans over her, and tenderly kisses her forehead. She slowly raises an emaciated hand and rubs his belly. He is cleaning out the refrigerator, giving away all the things she liked to eat. We gather around the table, hands on her coffee cups, compliment the endless pastries her sister has been baking. 
look through old photographs, play with the cat and dog, talk about how helpful hospice has been. He stands and walks to her bed. Her mouth is agape between two yellow bloated cheeks. He drops more morphine under her tongue. The corner is empty of her bed. There are phone calls, fees, and visitation times. We sit around the table, occasionally catching each other's eyes, attempting empathetic smiles through our tears. My mother reads the obituary to her father. He weeps. Okay. Wow, it's, it sounds as wonderful as I hoped it would. Um, and I do want to give a nod to the prose authors. We're going to have a couple we're going to hear from, and, and Buck read. Um, when you write long work, it's so hard to have somebody say, you get five minutes. <laughs> so I know, and I appreciate the fact that they've each you know, created this excerpt from their work, because I know that you'll want to go and read the entire piece. Um, so from, from my time in creative writing around here and as a display advisor, a few people to introduce. Um, Ian Hilgendorf, um, he's going to be reading from May Your Last Breath Be a Dance. Um, and one thing I can say about Ian is he was part of a creative writing class that was amazingly diverse and cohesive at the same time. It was just one of those great classes that, that comes together um, so much so that they even got behind me when I got us involved into this huge spoken word project. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, the Grand Rapids Public Museum had this great idea for Earth Day. And they, they because I had been working with them on a, um, a group um, project, they asked me, would you like to do something with the arts? And so knowing I have an environmental literature interest and in the arts, so I dreamed up this big music, art, spoken word, image piece, and it looked really easy at first. Um, we pulled it off. It was a great success. Um, right down to one of the um, musicians at GRCC had a classical piano piece that he had written that he premiered there. And it was just a wonderful event. So, um, so Ian still talks to me after that. And uh, he's also living, working, um, writing in Grand Rapids um, with his wife, Abby, and daughter, Genevieve. Um, and most recently, he's been published in Bull Men's Fiction online. Um, Ian will be our first reader in this group. Jessica Clark, the second reader who is going to be here, um, isn't here for a great reason. Um, I met Jessica. She was a display student editor. Um, and I actually have met and re-met Jessica at a lot of um, activist-oriented um, events. She's now a director at the Kalamazoo Peace Center, and tonight she helped to organize an event to protest Western Michigan University's proposed sale of a great public green space, if any of you are Broncos, you might want to put in on this, um, called the Old Orchard Farm. They're considering selling it for development, so Jessica's there to tell them about other ideas tonight. Um, another writer from this time, another display editor, actually, is Sarah Barker. Um, she's going to be writing a reading from an essay um, titled Non-Migratory, which I thought was great with what Catherine had to say, Embracing the Discomfort of Winter. Um, I first met Sarah, I think it was 2010, if not 2011, in an environmental literature course I was teaching called Ecolit and Activism. And it was very clear that um, her passion for social and environmental justice was just part of who she is, um, just simply part of who she is, not separable from Sarah and those issues. Um, when the class ended, in fact, she organized a, a, a group lovingly called Book Club um, that is still meeting today. Um, students that have gone from creative writing through my environmental literature classes, um, they somehow find each other and, and keep reading and writing and talking together years later. Um, Sarah's also a very talented singer and songwriter. Um, she recently rele released an album called For the Water that she actually um, produced 
um, as a fundraiser for the Michigan Land, Air, Water Defense. Um, so without further ado, I think I'll invite Ian and then Sarah up to read. Thank you, Marianne. Um, one of the great things about being a, a long fiction writer, uh, as Marianne pointed out, is that um, you get a lot of opportunities to kind of let yourself open up and breathe with your text, right? And um, one of the things that I really like to do with old stories is to take them back and rework them and turn them into something that's a little bit different. Um, and because the previous or the original story uh, was quite a bit longer than this version of it, um, I, I had an opportunity to do that. So um, this is also kind of the director's cut. Some of the bad stuff that I didn't like from the first version is cut out. And then there's some new stuff that was added in that I thought was better. You guys can decide for that if you like. So this is uh, May Your Last Breath Be a Dance. Thomas lay in bed and squinted to watch the clock hands turn. There were no numbers on the clock's face, just blotchy black areas like bad teenage acne. His vision was the latest perpetrator in a line of many. It was as if each faculty had one by one weighed their options between two warring factions and settled upon retreat where they waved a white flag of surrender and marched into the enemy's camp with hands held high. He was reminded of all the discomforts of old age as his heart began to buck and sputter. There was difficulty breathing, numb feet, a horrid metallic taste that never seemed to leave his mouth. Heartburn, joint discomfort, it wasn't always so. When his wife was alive, they used to do all sorts of things. They'd gone dancing, consumed good scotch. He enjoyed the pleasure of cigar smoke as it evaporated around his owed lips like fog. What had happened? These days, without Merrill, his daughter came and checked in on him every so often and left him with a freezer full of microwave-safe food. He was grateful, but Thomas reached for his walker. He needed to use the bathroom, so he hauled himself up from a sit and rolled his weight forward. His legs felt as fragile as plastic cutlery beneath him. The bathroom was out his bedroom door and down a short hallway, which caved in around him in a tremulous blur, the darkness vibrating as though it were a television screen static, like the squirming of a frenzied hive of bees. He looked down longingly at the shapeless mass of his hands on the walker. They were weak now, though they hadn't always been so. He tightened his grip until pain encircled him. Then he remembered, his hands on a steering wheel, the sun beating against his upturned face, golden breeze blown in off of Lake Michigan while a shimmer, shimmering reflection of the world glistened off nearby waves. Merrill's soft hand nestled into the nape of his neck, rubbing the hair behind his ears. This is paradise, she said and he'd agreed with her over the hum of the car engine through lips clenching a cigarette. Paradise. And the image was gone, though his need remained. Necessity coaxed him on. Each step was its own puzzle, his body trying to figure out how to put itself together again. Thomas looked at his feet, padding away at the carpet. They did not seem to be his own. Rather, they were the mechanical workings of some greater being whom he hoped might still care to direct his movements. He hoped, though skepticism grew, that God might still have a plan for him, that the Creator could just as, just as soon return his body to full working order as care for the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. He could fly, he could dance. As he walked, Thomas recalled an interview, Terry Gross, speaking to an aged ballet dancer, and he had said that dance was any sort of movement, that it was as impermanent as breathing, that somehow his last breath would be a dance. Then the man laughed with real pleasure in his voice. Thomas couldn't figure why, still couldn't. What was so funny about becoming nothing? 
about passing into non-existence. He rolled through the bathroom, set his walker aside, and pulled his pajama bottoms down like a toddler so that his rear was exposed. The pressure in his bladder mounted, and Thomas let loose. There was no sight or sound to explain what was happening down below, only release, the simple sensation of depleting oneself. His body responded, relaxed. Standing there, Thomas felt for a moment as though gravity was losing its reality around him. His balance began to topple, but he caught himself at the last moment, his free hand against the wall. Once done, Thomas reached down and grabbed hold of his pajama bottoms, hoisting them back up his hips. They were warm and soggy as they gathered around his privates. Shame. Had he failed to pull his pants down fully? Was his vision and result resulting aim so bad that he had fired straight down into his trousers, completely unaware? God damn it! God damn it! He slapped the toilet seat down, tried to pivot and sit in one quick motion, but his shifting center of gravity was ill-suited to his 89 years. In descent, Thomas's arms flailed in a dramatized pirouette. His left foot kicked out against the porcelain toilet. His right shoulder hit the wall first, then his cheekbone and skull. Thomas slid to the floor where his face met the cool linoleum. His pants were down around his ankles and his breath puffed from him, raspy but warm as it bounced off the floor and flooded his nostrils. He could sense the noises of the house through vibrations on his cheek, the air conditioner, water running through pipes, his heart beating against the bath mat. His laughter, too. He could feel that through the floor, against his skin, in his withered hands, through the sadness of his turtle shell scrotum smashed against linoleum like silly putty. Laughing. It was funny in a weird way. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sarah Barker. I'm going to be reading from an essay that I wrote for Marianne's class called Non-Migratory, Embracing the Discomfort of Winter. Um, first, I want to say that it's a real honor to be here and a, a real privilege. And I think the real privilege, though, was being here as a student because without GRCC, I would have never found my voice. Um, so I, this is my little nod to all the no-shows because I, it was really hard to whittle this down. But I did my best, so kind of ride with me. The black, unforgiving waters crept around the patches of ice, reminding me that it took ages for the last shift in climate to create the Great Lakes. My gaze widened with the thought of bearing witness to what could have been summer in the midway point of change. I consider myself fortunate to call this place my home, rooted near the unpredictability of one of the planet's largest reserves of glacial fresh water. Migration seems to be the trend here in Michigan, to leave when things get cold, uncomfortable. People leave in search of jobs, food, shelter from the storms, the ones blowing in off the lake and the ones that brew deep inside their marrow. They keep moving, refuse to adapt, they uproot their own history, leaving the state, the lakes, the forests to fend against in toxic industrial practices in the promise of revenue for a desperate budget. My brother packed up and left over 10 years ago now, before the total collapse of Detroit. The rumblings of the coming bankruptcy were within the state's infrastructure. Where those were the initial tremors when he decided to go. He thought he could leave the sting of the frigid bitterness of being a gay man in conservative West Michigan behind him. Over the past few months, I've heard the anger and grief reviving in his guts, revealing itself in his tone, his language, and his tears. No matter how much I argue and urge him to come back and take his role in the growth our family is experiencing, he resists, blaming the weather for his disdain. To have come of age here as a hypersensitive woman has made me wonderfully steadfast, like the trees. The lack of comfort during the precipitous winters and humid summers have fed my nature 
and made me adaptable to the climate of adversity. My brother made himself a transplant. I'm the dune grass, unmoved and bearing witness, contemplating next year's growth while reflecting from a state of dormancy. In order to properly appreciate the spring, I must live through the long nights of winter. My nurturing skills have been sharpened by learning to cope with being uncomfortable. When food is scarce, we find ways to get through. We make snow angels. I know these beaches because I've walked them my whole life. I can measure my life by the trees in my father's yard. I know what the North Country smells like in which creeks flow into the Grand River. I sing to the crows that pick the fields in the fall when their landscape turns gold. I hear the frogs of my mother's backyard that once sang so loud and joyous grow quieter each year as more housing developments fill in their wetlands, their only home. I anticipate the return of the birds who dine on fish and seek refuge in the Gulf of Mexico over the winter. They might not come back the same after the catastrophe of last spring's BP oil spill, if you can call that kind of human negligence an accidental spill, and the untested chemical dispersants used by the US government to combat the 205.8 million gallons of crude unleashed into the water. I see the invasive emerald ash borer decimate forests alongside other insect blights because recent winters aren't long enough to keep their populations down. While the semi-trucks loaded with trees rumble down the highway, the latest gold rush of natural gas and the deadly consequences of hydraulic fracturing are threatening our water supply with 2,122 times the safe level of radiation. When people ran for the beaches last April as record high temperatures coaxed out the cherry and apple blossoms out too soon, I expressed feelings of uneasiness with my late gardening partner. The truths that nature presents are not always comfortable. The farmers of the region saw it when their crops were bombarded by a late ice storm. It seems our new norms are rogue ice storms, freakish unseasonable occurrences of winter, red lightning, and an uncomfortable feeling in my gut as I'm hypnotized by the beauty of it. This is our winter. The desperation of sparrows and crows foraging for food is what we are experiencing in Michigan, like they have been for decades in West Virginia. Those who refuse to deal with the uncomfortable truth of where the profit-driven free market and unchecked industrial complex and in America run from it to where things are still growing. They attempt to remove themselves from the nature of it. The beauty of winter is the reversal of comfort and growth. It is a blank canvas, waiting, reflecting, germinating the seeds of spring, of new growth, with new perils. We in Michigan are America's proving grounds. Our cupboards barren, our ground still frozen. The ravages of desire manifest in our lakes and landfills stuffed with trash from Canada and neighboring states. We have a very uncomfortable choice to make about nature, or we shall suffer the fate of the garbage islands of Manila or the rivers of Indonesia. Let the third world state be visible to the masses. The time has come to see. I choose to be non-migratory. The warmer climates do not suit me in their growth of gated communities on alligator habitats. I've grown accustomed to adversity, to austerity, to being uncomfortable, as discomfort has spurn my growth and creativity. It is my nature to make new. I am, of course, a mother. Mothers struggle through pain in order to create new life, then fight like hell to protect it. So I shall either serve to set an example of where we go from here, or a glaring tragedy marking the way we should have gone, but embarked upon too late. Nature is not the mother that spoils her children with luxury, but rather teaches them lessons of responsibility to life all life, even if those lessons don't seem palatable. There's no running away from home this time. There will be nowhere left that's unaffected by nature's mandate. To change our nature from detached consumers in our comfortable houses back to one another in the land on which we depend, nature will change us. This we all have in common. Thank you.
Okay, so I got three more here. Uh, Mike's own. Where's he at? Right here. Uh, hiding back there, I am. <laughs> Mike's a filmmaker, uh, scripter, or screenwriter, but he's a whole lot of other things too. He's done a bit of traveling, a bit of film work. He wrote for a surreal pulp fiction blog entitled Fiction Stew. Uh, essays in uh, 616 Zine and Apocalypse. Occupocalypse. Okay. Uh, he's currently working at a blue collar warehouse job, which I can relate to. I did that for a while. Um, I've done. Uh, he's done some freelance screenwriting and editing. He's currently in the running for HBO's Diverse Writer Search. Um, I expect great things from Mike. He's one of these people that just never stops growing. Um, he'll be doing a piece called Shock Doctrine Bride. Um, Taylor Jean D Drayton <coughs> is the second one um, here. And um, Taylor was quiet, but her stuff was always very, very, very precise. There was this little tiny stories encapsulated in poems that dealt with real tough issues in life. Um, I always found her stuff really amazing, and I don't think people saw it, enough people saw in it what I did. But anyways, that's another story. Um, her poetry work is now on a bit of hiatus because she is uh, focusing on building her makeup artistry business. So if you want to know something about makeup, come and see her. Um, she's also completing her degree in social work. Uh, while trying not to be too distracted by her best friend, Yuri the dog. Okay, and finally, Samantha Jo Resner. Um, jo is going to read uh, The Island. Um, she's currently attending Grand Valley State University and I think going into teaching, is that right? English teaching. So um, it's one of the things I, love, I loved about doing this job was how many people went on to become either writers or teachers and then connected with me later. And um, those of you who are teachers, just to make a point, um, you want to keep in touch with the best and brightest of your students, get on Facebook when you retire and make friends. <laughs> I got all my creative writers and I got all my Shakespeare students. They, I talk all the time. The dialogues continue to this day. OK, so Mike, you're up first. Oh, well, thanks. Everything always goes in uh, alphabetical order, being zone, I'm used to being the last one. Uh, man, I can't wait till this whole working for a living thing stops. Uh, well, I'm going to be reading my uh, poem, Shock Doctor and Pride, uh, a little background on it. I'll be honest, there's, uh, there's nothing beautiful about being poor, but uh, love, you know, that can be beautiful. Uh, let's say love goes awry and class con conflict rears its ugly head, well, it's, uh, it's not so beautiful, especially if you have a dying mother. And, uh, well, then it starts to resemble Milton Friedman's uh, disaster capitalism. And next thing you know, uh, you're living in an episode of Breaking Bad. So uh, <laughs> without further ado, uh, shocked after and bride. You'll never know what it's like. You say it's not your problem if I wind up homeless. Then call me at odd hours of, uh, of an eclipse morning weeping about how I'm the only one, how you miss me sleeping at your side. You're so, you're so sorry for the way things are? Thanks. You'll never know what it's like, clawing and scraping like I did, to even get to this menial level of survival. On the roller coaster labor scale, working a five-dime store job, affording nothing but nothing with infinite dreams, you'll never know what it's like, going hungry to pay for a surgery on your credit card, or even decide, what do I need more this week? Heat or electric? Fuck it. Winner's here. Happy anniversary, honey. You'll never know what it's like. Not your problem, right? Tell me to have sweet dreams. I want you to have dreams about rich girls, rejected by working class lads, put out on the street, then shot by private soldiers because the, the school's budget just got redirected. Taylor Jayden. Um, 
Dave's right. I don't like reading things out loud, and I never have, and I probably never will. Um, but if you'd like to turn to page uh, 130, you can see that I'm in the real display 100. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyways, this is called The Secret Keepers Who Cut Into This Guy. I threw everything too heavy for my shoulders up into the tops of the highest buildings just north of the river where I spent my time at Michigan and Oak Street in the Four Seasons Midwest where the seasons wash everything back down to me. Yet for a while before a storm, every anguish lends its weight to my tallest friends and confidants, the buildings who hold on to my troubles. Thank you. Hello, I'm Samantha Resner, um, and I'm going to be reading The Island. Um, a lot of people actually ask me if this is a metaphor, but um, it's actually not. Uh, I grew up on a lake, and so this is based off of a real island. Um, I was very drawn to nature and to the water as a child, so much that my family actually nicknamed the, me the mermaid. So, <laughs> um, so this is The Island. The first time I swam all the way to the island, I was 10 years old. I climbed out of that lake like a wild thing. Mud between my toes, seaweed in my hair. A breath of relief left my lungs as a startled baby turtle jumped back into the water and swam away. My makeshift home slightly storm damaged. I gathered large branches and leaves as construction material. A garden snake slithered quickly past me as I trudged through bushes picking blackberries. As the sky changed from blue to purple, I climbed a tall tree and watched the sunset over the horizon. I rubbed my tired eyes. The stars and moon and the flicker of a firefly were the only light left. The crickets and the bullfrog sang a ballad. And in the distance, my mother's worried voice calling my name. Okay, we have um, four more readers from the 100 issues of Display issue. And then there are some current Display Writing Award winners, three who are here, that are going to read as our closing. Um, I keep forgetting to say this, so I've been drawing pictures all over my sheet, and I'm going to remember this now. Um, those of you who are reading tonight from the 100 issues of Display, um, there are two copies that were out um, early on that I wanted to have everybody sign for the English department. So if you haven't done that yet, um, find me or Lily afterwards um, and um, sign your copies, please. I've also left um, several um, nice fine point permanent markers if anyone else who's listening would like to gather anybody's signature in your booklets. Um, I see Robin Van Royen back there. Robin? There she is. Everybody turn to wave and say hello to Robin, <laughs> who selected the art for the 100 issues of display. I hope the art exhibit's going well. And, and Robin, thank you so much. It looks beautiful. Um, so, is Noel here? Oh, that's too bad. But that happens. Um, so I have this whole intensity gig thing going with my last four um, introductions. So I'm going to stay with it, even though Noelle's not here as number two on the intensity scale. Um, so first, um, Jean Williams. Um, I knew Jean in a literature class that was a fiction class. Um, and what I can say about Jean in terms of intensity is she has a quiet intensity. But just because it's quiet doesn't mean it's not intense. Um, this need to dig deeper. Um, when, I took a, when I did my Master of Fine Arts in Creative Writing, I had a writing instructor that everybody knew would write on everything, dig deeper, dig deeper. And you'd, you'd want to you know, throw it against the wall sometimes. I'm digging. Um, Jean digs deeper for understanding all the time, and I always appreciated that about her. 
Um, so I'm going to let her own words speak for her in a bio here. It makes sense. As the daughter of a book hoarder, reading and writing has always been something very natural to me. It wasn't until my second year of college that I found a true passion for it. I'm currently in the dental hygiene program at GRCC, and writing is still a vital part of my life. It gives me clarity in a chaotic world and allows me to have an honest conversation with myself. Um, Noelle, who unfortunately isn't here, um, she was the, the number two intense person, um, and I devoted the word energetic intensity to her. Um, a kind of pursuit of expression that you, you couldn't over-challenge her in a creative writing course. Um, she is a horsewoman. Um, she's back from a time in Oregon. Um, and she's back in her hometown of Petoskey right now and was hoping to make it tonight. So um, if you get a chance to read Noelle's poem, Paradise, um, do so. Catherine Tremblay... Um, I know Catherine's work mainly from being a display advisor and listening to the display student editors talk about her work. Um, as Walt talked about in the beginning, um, display is, is firm and strong with its student editing focus. Um, the students read the work, they select it. Um, the way that I've come to work with them is trying to mentor them as an editor of a literary magazine. Um, and so I don't even read the work before they do, but I listen and facilitate and try to figure out how to um, get each three of them in the poetry or prose um, categories to select final work. And so Catherine's work, um, words that came up for her in terms of the intensity scale was just a keen, timeless sense of observation. And you're going to hear that in her short piece, The Complexity of Sovereignty. It's no surprise then to find out that she, um, after leaving GRCC in 2012 to 2014, she's at Grand Valley State University majoring in film and video production, and that she hopes on entering a career as a film, um, a documentary filmmaker. So there's that keen sense of observation for sure. Um, Kevin Brown is our pivotal reader tonight who may have Aaron Stoner read for him because he's losing his voice. We'll see what happens. Um, he's but got he's got it. Kevin's going to get this one. He's going to come through. <laughs> um, his poem, Dinner Bell, was featured in the 100 issues of Display, and it also won a Display Writing Award this year. So he's the perfect you know, final reader out of the 100 issues to turn us toward um, the Display Writing Awards. Um, and I'm glad I could help spring Kevin from his Psych 201 class tonight. <laughs> and he's honored to be here reading um, among his creative writing professor, Kim Weingarten, um, who he said it's amazing to read uh, alongside writers of her magnitude. So starting with Jean Williams. Never been in front of this many people before. Hope my face doesn't turn too red. Um, I wrote a poem in Mrs. Weingarten's creative writing class, actually. It's a replacement poem. Um, it was inspired by Sylvia Plath Stillborn, and it's called Donkey Farm. These donkeys cannot see. It's an unquenchable thirst. They silenced their hooves and tongues beyond weak. Their inky eyes gleamed with obedience. If they shied away from floating around like clouds, it couldn't be for absence of heartbeat. Oh, I do hold what masters the strings. They are mundane in thought and desire and every meal. They gaze so obliviously in the thirsty meadow. They slave and slave and slave and slave for me. And yet the mule doesn't fuss and the sun always comes. They are not jacks, they are not even asses though they carry a jacky and an assy stare. It wouldn't be fair if they were humans, and perhaps they once were. But they are peasants, and they're full near peasants without fowl, and they easily leap 
and do not question the hoop. Hello, um, my name is Kate Tremblay. I am super honored to be here. Um, super honored to be in two 100 year centennial editions as well. Um, and I'd just like to say it's a great honor tonight to be able to um, read alongside David Cope, who I've heard before, and Kim Weingarten, my old teacher. Um, it's just been really surreal to be here. In fact, I had to bring witnesses so that I can remember it later. Um, so my piece is called The Complexity of Sovereignty. There are bees making their home in my porch. All the light in the world is focused on them, and it refracts into my eyes, stunning me with brilliance. There's a quickness of purpose here, like a steady beating heart, and I wonder if the width of my hips and the lengths of my arms could operate the same. Placid in a summer haze, I watch them fly. Their orotund voices hum in unison as they flit from flower to ground to tree to nest. Looking up, they are swimming in an absolute blue, but the sun makes me turn away and examine once again their home in my home. All is obscured behind a supporting beam, so I lean in, careful not to offend their petulant humors. My neighbors decorate with tessellations of shapes, forming a half-finished hive. Some are departing. They leave behind them a queen, though they are all crowned in gold, and brothers too numerous to count. Others enter, twitching their legs together to shake off pollen and finding their place in the labyrinth. My senses fail me in that I can't see inside their exclusive guild, nor can I join. I am too massive, clumsy, and afraid. When a cloud pl passes over the porch, they carry on while I stop to shiver in the shadow. They have each other, and I only have a vague idea of what their existence is really like. Folding my arms into myself against the chill, a keen pain shoots up from wrist to brain to mouth with a sharp intake of breath, and as I look down at the sting, the shuddering shell of the bee falls like an autumn leaf to the weather-bleached wood. Bending down, I pick it up and hold it delicately in the center of my palm, just for a moment, until the wind casts it away and I am myself again. Thank you. First time in front of a microphone. <clears throat> See how this goes. <clears throat> Hopefully I don't lose my voice too much. <clears throat> this is dinner bell. The diamond field's empty as the dinner bell rings. Mothers holler, yell, and whistle. My friends quickly scatter and flee. Afraid of their screams, they race towards home. I holster my glove and bat as I pedal home, pedaling towards that ring, my ring. The dinner bell rings. I hear it echo through clanking tags and blanks. Meal time, it nears us on the firing range. Practice makes perfect, my mom used to say, when I'd pull on my bike from a day of play. My mother lectured me to be a man. Oh, mama, what have I done? The dinner bell rings. It rings and rings. My ears are deafened. The shells come raining down. Caught in an open field, my hand a blurry red, surrounded by my friends, the dead. Mama, ring the bell. Take me home. Take me home. Let me hear that dinner bell. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. You made it. So Walt Lockwood is going to return um, as this year's judge of the Display Writing Awards and um, introduce our three readers who are here and um, talk about his judging comments. I'd like to encourage everybody to, to mill around after these last three readers. Um, if you haven't yet picked up your copy of the 100 issue, issue of Display, there should be more right outside the door. And um, refreshments are served in the back too, so thank you. Marianne has asked me to read my, the comments I made to each of the winners, which is uh, a bit difficult because I, I addressed them to them instead of to a general audience. 
Uh, but I think that if I wait at least with the poets until after they read to read the comments, they'll make more sense. Uh, in the case of uh, Dinner Bell by Kevin, uh, this is what I said, the contrast of innocence and experience, the security of home and the horror of the battlefield, the living friends and dead friends, the comfort of the dinner bell and the scream of shells raining down all make a simple, concrete, powerful statement. The uh, first prize winner in poetry was Corey Tyler for a poem called Memory, and I think I will have Corey do that poem, and uh, then I will come back up. Good evening. I look much better as a memory. Faded glances and still strong feelings. That sensation of running your fingers through my hair, so much kinder than a photograph, so much sweeter than video. Still evokes more emotion than any minced words love letter that I wrote and read while I was drunk at two, and that I passed you in the morning as you left for work. It becomes less about acne scars and bloodshot eyes, more about whispered words on endless nights, and the memory of your steady time breathing in and out on repeat in the middle of the night. But crueler still, for the pictures just end, the letters burn, and the CD with all our little trysts and turns smashed and melted in the fireplace that we sat by on late winter nights, talking endless on about how the world will end. But memories never really end. Like embers of a house fire, they just keep burning until they drown all they can, and what's left must collapse. And about that poem called Memory, I said, uh, what a wonderful opening line. I look much better as a memory. Memorable phrases, uh, such as all our little trysts and turns. Uh, memories are better than photos or videos or love letters because memories last, and for the same reason they are crueler because they won't go away, especially where a broken relationship is concerned. I don't see a misstep in this poem. Uh, the second prize poem, uh, the second prize award went to Aaron Stoner for a poem called Hear Pressure. Good evening. Um, real quick, I'll just say um, I've had the joy of having Ms. Weingarten as my professor uh, for the last year, and it's just been a real treat. Um, I think I had the same assignment as Eugene. Um, I had to do a replacement poem, and um, I chose um, a poem by Brian Turner entitled Hear Bullet. And um, uh, pretty quickly, when I sat down to write um, in the Quiet Cafe a few months ago, I knew um, I wanted to write um, about the drums. So here's uh, Hear Pressure. If a beat is what you desire, then here is bass, tom, and snare. Here is the whip crack of the head, the sizzle of the hi-hats resonating with foot pedal thumping out fours. Here is the frenetic energy that you desire, that catchy rhythm, that melodic burst into broken sticks and sweat. And I challenge you to finish the song, because here, drum kit, here is where I finish the work that began with a cymbal crash. Here is where blood-clenched forearms thunderously pound on the floor tom and snare in unison, actuating the ferocious knot of my head for the drumming I have within me. Each roll and thud hit harder and harder and harder because here, drum kit, here is where the world begins, keeping time every time. Thank you. And my comment to that, that poem here, Pressure, it echoes Brian Turner's intense poem. It turns 
Turner's life-taking bullet into life-giving rhythms of the persona's drums and art. Word sounds and rhythms work together uh, throughout to express content. It builds an intensity to the final release, impressive poem. I think the final one, and this is a prose piece, and it's the first prize prose piece by Grace Mars. It's called Escape, Creative Nonfiction. I will read first because, uh, Grace, you have to excerpt it, and uh, I can at least give a sense of what goes on in this. It begins with the, the main character and an unnamed tension in the story uh, that forces her out on this farmland to run and, and to run her guts out. And uh, we keep running with her, and as the story progresses, we wonder what the issues are in it, and then all of a sudden, at the end, there is this jarring revelation of purpose. And it delivers beautifully. Excellent writing, solid structure. The running is her sanity, her lifeline, but her path circles back to the thing that threatens to crush her. Escape for now is impossible, but the frenetic running is making her stronger. Bravo. Grace. That is, after so many amazing authors, a bit of a hard act to follow up. Um, funny story, this piece, Escape, was actually an assignment for my first English composition class, 101, as a freshman, terrified, of course, and I have to give thanks to Professor Mowers for all of your help. So here is Escape. It starts out with a feeling, like tar building up in my veins, blowing, blocking the flow of life through my body. My mind becomes cloudy and I cannot think. My heart feels like someone is holding it in their palm, crushing it slowly and painfully. I want to scream, to lash out, and then I go outside and I run. I feel like I am dying, but I also know that I have never felt more alive. It is hot. The air that I am swimming through is thick with humidity and hard to breathe into my laboring lungs. I must be careful, I must be careful. The tractor has left marks in the ground, deep holes that my feet dip into, holes where I nearly sprain or even break my ankles. Sweat drips into my eyes as I look down every few paces to where my feet will fall in just a moment, praying that I will not trip. The sun is shining almost obnoxiously, burning my skin slowly, one cell at a time. My clothes are all black and soak in the heat uncomfortably, but I ignore it as I smile. This sensation, this absolute exhaustion that I was already feeling, it was one of the most exhilarating things I can ever remember. For once, I am in absolute control. I control where I run, how fast I go, how far I go. And nobody can control me. Nobody can stop me. I can push to the brink of inability and push a little more. The power is stunning, captivating. This is my choice, my ability. I jump over one of the dugouts in the field and the weeds slap against my bare shins as I go. The skin from my ankles to my knees itches from weed scratching, caressing lightly as I rush past. I want to stop and pull up my socks or to rub the itch away, but I don't. I get very close to the humming fence and the cows on the other side rush away in instinctive fear self-preservation kicking into gear as they disappear. I veer to the right and rush into the little valley that is created between three rolling hills. I slowly come to a stop, safely hidden from the sight of the road or my neighbors, and allow myself to embrace just how exhausted I feel, mind, body, and soul. My legs burn, my chest hurts, but the sense of freedom remains. After a heartbeat, I turn and dash up the hill before I can change my mind. And when I reach the top, I can see everything. I can see the farm that my neighbors own, the pumpkin patch on the other side of our land. I can see five different fields growing five different things. Pumpkins, hay, corn, wheat, peas, and green beans. The corn is tall. Fronds neatly flourish in their assigned spaces. 
When the wind hits them just the right way, the thready strands that protect the beads peel back, revealing a pale and shiny yellow surface. The pumpkin patch is the opposite, a chaotic mess of delightfully green leaves that harbor secretive little thorns that scratch the surface of the skin. The canopy of green hides the pumpkin sprout safely from the sight of rude intruding eyes. But if I look at the field from just the right angle, I can see them. They hide under their protective umbrella, creating for themselves a whole new world that is secret and hidden from me. They are as mysterious as the fairies in the woods these pumpkins are, and they keep just as many secrets. I head further away from my starting point, to the point in the land where the property line lay. It isn't a line. It is a gateway, a crossing. The weeds are higher here. Fronds reach up to my waist. I step carefully, watching for the snakes that have made this haven their home. And when they have had enough time to disperse, I cross over and I am in another land. The pumpkins are growing on the other side of the old dirt path, <coughs> hidden by trees, overcast and shadowed by their leaves, giving me a reprieve from the relentless sun. And I start running again, as fast as my legs will go. I will die, my lungs will explode, I will pass out from exhaustion. These are all very real feelings racing through me, but the freedom again trumps them all. No one knows where I am. No one can ruin the serenity, the peace that I feel in this place where no one knows that I go. It is my own sacred, secret, hidden world. The path goes down a sharp hill, and now I am not running so much as controlling the way my feet fall, bounce off the ground, and then fall again. The dirt is loose here, and there are deep tracks from tractor tires, slightly washed away by the heavy rain. The hill evens out, and I sprint as fast as I can until I pass the full, two full fields of tall corn and make a sharp turn to the left that takes me through the divisor between cornfield and pumpkin patch. I sprint until I am almost to the woods, but I stop at the ditch. The path goes over a pipe that bridges the gap, but then it empties either side into each other below my feet. Tall fronds grow on the edges, and a green froth settles on the surface. I pick up a handful of rocks and toss them strategically, testing the depth of the water, seeing how far I can make the mossy froth sink down. I do this every time I come here, and I do it without fail. Every time a handful of rocks, and every time, one at a time, I throw them down. A red one, rough on the surface and gritty, about the size of a crab apple, cuts through the surface of the froth and sinks down. It stirs up the water, and I can smell the stink that rises above the surface. The rain had washed the fertilizer from the four surrounding fields into the ditch. I let the last rock, the size of my fingernail, slide between my fingers and watch it drop. And I look at the woods, thick and green, while I stretch. They are beautiful, mysterious. They reach up to the sky like skyscrapers, hiding whatever their depths contain. I am jealous of them. Then I turn away, back to the path from which I came. My lungs are now thankfully recovered. My burning muscles are slowly cooling. And then it floods through me like a waterfall over a stone. The frustration leaves, draining like a poison from the blood, and my resolve returns to me. My mother is dead. I cannot change that fact. My stepfather despises me. I cannot change that. But my brother needs me. Most of all, I cannot change that. I would not change that even if I could. But one thing I can do. I can run. I can escape, if just for a while. But I always go back. And so it will start all over again. Thank you, Grace. Um, Grace was also the re uh, recipient of one of our creative writing scholarships this year, so nice work. I want to thank a couple of more people that I may have missed early on, um, not because of lack of importance, but just the need to get this uh, rolling. Um, Lily Anderson um, and Janice Balia. Um, Lily and Janice, um, Lily from the School of Arts and Sciences, and Janice as our English department chair have supported this project from the beginning, so I wanted to say thank you for that. Um, and then all of the readers who are here, um, thank you. Thank you all for, for coming, yes.
And of course, our former display advisors, David Cope and, and Walt Lockwood. <laughs> so again. She worked like a Trojan on this thing. She deserves it. Thanks, David. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so refreshments at the back. If I hadn't had, haven't had a chance to say hello, I know some of you are here that may have been featured in the magazine but may have chosen not to read, and that's fine. Um, but stick around for a few, grab some snacks, um, mingle teacher to student. And again, thanks this wonderful group of readers for a wonderful texture of voices tonight. Thank you.